This is, I think, one of my favorite subjects in history. Um, and I think a lot of people are interested in it as well, which is why um, History Channel has made like a whole like hit series off of this. Um, but we'll start off with the big question here. So we're still in this cultural significance uh, sort of canon section, but what's the cultural significance of intimidation? So how do cultures intimidate one another and why do they? Sorry, Siri just heard me and wanted to answer the question. <laughs> cultural significance of intimidation, it's a big question. Yeah, that's a great, a great place to start, imperialism. Yeah, I totally agree there. So if you or your culture thinks that it's better, mm -hmm, if you think that you're better, than others, then it gives it, you're giving yourself a justification for your behavior, right? Very cool. I love this crossover that you've made, Elizabeth. Um, so moving on, our works today, believe it or not, are in a huge way about intimidation. Now, since you are here, um, I'll let you choose two things that you want to try and guess what is going to what's happening there, what we're looking at, and I'll do the other thing. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad that you've quickly seen it. So since you already know the culture, you can guess um, maybe what some things are indicative of. So that top one there is pointing to um, what looks kind of like a the connecting teeth. The mid one there is pointing to the texture. And the bottom one there is indicating what this piece might be connected to. So give me your guesses as to what each part of this sculpture is. And then I will leave one then blank and I'll come and fill that one in. Yeah, you already know. So maybe you could put down the bottom of the prow. Maybe what I'll do is the texture right here. I'll take the middle one if you want to take the top and bottom. Because that's the one that people are most surprised by. So it is, in fact, the texture of the scales, but it's also So there is a lot more going on here than I think people give it credit for. You're right, this is the mouth of a beast. It could be holding something, but normally it's kind of left open. Um, and then the middle one right here is um, what I'm going to show you in a second, the texture of the scales. So this is meant to show texture, but there's kind of a funny configuration of it. And the scale pattern, you can really see it in the one to the right is actually supposed to represent winding vines, which comes from the, the world tree. So anyone watching this recording later, if you know anything about the Norse mythology, you might know that the world tree, the Yggdrasil, I think is what they call it, um, is often shown with these weaving vines. Believe it or not, we are seeing right here sort of a purest connection to what will later be a very common design. You'll see this in tattoo and in jewelry. My wedding ring even has it, but maybe I'm going to put this over to the right and let it load. Um, maybe you've come across these before, Celtic knots, which are these really pretty patterns. They look kind of lacy, like they're sewn together. Um, believe it or not, 
So these are a perfect merger between two cultures. They're called the Celtic Knot because the Celts were in fact invaded by on Vikings by Norse people. And then when their cultures combined, they also brought some shared symbolism. Um, so to the right, um, the Celtic patterns were very different before the Norse invaded um, Britain. In the bottom right here, the prow, which is um, anyone watching this recording later doesn't know their ship terminology, that is the front of the ship. This is the piece that's right in front. So while this piece seems sort of tame to us and more decorative now, believe it or not, it was in fact quite intimidating back in the day. So before I dive in to our to spill the tea, um, if you have any questions about this artwork, cool. Turn on the video. Cool. Today I have actually made I now you know for me I have a. <gasps> foam frother now so I can get the texture on top. Um, but this is actually an ice cream tea with um, mint in it today. And I have a chilled foam froth at the top as well that I put some vanilla syrup in. So very fancy, right? <laughs> um, so speaking of intimidation, ooh, a raspberry tea. I wonder how that tastes. Is that one of the... Um, Trying to get a brand. Celestial Seasonings, I think, might be the brand. Is that one of those? Yeah. They like to do raspberry a lot. It's not a lot of mixtures that they have. This is just, just the Stash Tea brand, the one that you see at a lot of coffee shops. Um, <laughs> so the tea on this piece today deals with some of our expectations. And I'm glad that I have you on board here, Elizabeth, because I know you know a lot of stuff already. Um, but I'm going to set up this poll here for yes or no questions. Okay. Um, so you already said that it is um, a Viking work. Now, yes or no, did the Vikings call themselves Vikings? No, you're right. They called themselves Norse. Okay. Clear that one. Um, yes, yes or no? Did um, the well, we call them the Vikings. Did the Vikings wear horned helmets? You're right. No, they did not. That was invented by Hollywood in the 50s. So they have never worn horned helmets. There are some uh, specific horn pieces that you might see, but it's not practical for warfare at all. So don't ever wear a horn helmet. <laughs> um, let's see. One more thing. Yes or no, were the Vikings considered dirty in their time? So uncleanly? Messy? No, you're right. They were actually some of the cleanest people in the ancient world. And that blood actually came from their obsession with blonde hair. So those of you who are a fan of the Marvel comics can tell me which major god had blonde hair. Oh, all right, Thor. So it was seen that to emulate Thor, to be manly, you were shooting for blonde hair. And believe it or not, a soap back in the day was really intense. It was basically made from a fat and um, something called lye, which is used in any soap production today, but on a much smaller scale. Um, when used in high concentration, it could actually bleach your hair. And lye just left on the skin will actually burn your skin too, so you don't want to do that. But um, if you would use this ancient soap, it would actually bleach your hair blonde. So men were often would bathe a lot more in the waters, in the rivers, to bleach that hair so that they could emulate Thor. Right. So this is something also misunderstood too, in that um, the Norse people we're not all connected. So they weren't one kingdom sending out Viking raids, too. They were, in fact, a whole bunch of different clans all spread out. And that's how a lot of the ancient world was at that time, right? Like everything was sort of spread out, a whole bunch of different worlds um, and small kingdoms. And only just now, during the Viking Age, 
for people starting to really become kingdoms and become larger collective groups. And that was actually out of fear of being invaded by um, people going on a Viking. So a Viking, that term, you actually went on a Viking, right? And I think you already know that, Elizabeth, but for someone watching this video later, it might surprise them. Um, we now call them Vikings, but they were in fact just called the Norse, which means the Nordic people, the people to the north. Um, so you're talking about anything in the Scandinavian area, you know, Denmark especially, um, uh, as well as like, even small places like Finland and such. Iceland was actually, and Greenland were both founded at this time by these same people. And the idea came from um, in the growing seasons, you've already planted your crops. Um, there was a pretty, in, there was a larger population of Nordic people to a small amount of land who weren't given a job. So if you didn't have land, you couldn't farm. So you had to get your money elsewhere, which was through stealing. Very rocky, right. Lots of sheep, because sheep can graze off of short grasses and thin soils, but um, it's very hard to farm. So in order to literally obtain that, you could steal. And actually what a lot of people don't know is that Vikings did raids on one another in communities. It was very common to raid your neighboring community. Um, and how they respected people of their community versus people away from their community was very different. Um, so as we were talking about intimidation, you brought up this form of nationalism. So thinking on a smaller scale, there was that same sentiment in small tribes, which meant um, there was respect was treated differently. So as a woman, this isn't, this is sort of an iffy time to be a woman <laughs> if you go back in time. Because in your community, you were given a lot of respect in the Norse people. So it's even said that um, in terms of virtue, if a man took a woman's hand to hold without her permission, her family had the right to punish that man for her own um, virtue. But any woman from another community was not given that same respect, which is something interesting to note. So um, just like any person from another community was often treated poorly, any woman could, was treated as well, especially in war times. And when they started sailing away from the Scandinavian lands towards places like Britain and France, they were treated that same way, which is where you get from, from the Viking pillaging and such. It's where we get this whole same notion. Um, another thing, actually, that surprises people is that the North people were surprisingly quick to convert to Christianity compared to all the other Germanic tribes in Europe. So I'm talking about um, the actual people in Germany, um, the people of France, and the people of Britain were actually incredibly difficult to convert to Christianity. There's records of it. Um, because remember, at this time, Christianity and um, the Holy Roman Empire were one thing. So if someone from the Holy Roman Empire was conquering another land, they inevitably the land had to also accept uh, Christianity or at this time, which was Catholicism. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> uh, the Vikings, or the North people, were surprisingly quick to convert because the concept of the afterlife seemed a lot better than their own and that their own was really risky. So what did you have to do to move on to the afterlife? I think you might know this, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, there were several afterlives. The most honorable was Valhalla. How would you get there? You had to die in battle, or at even protecting your own home. So women, obviously when men went off to raid other communities, women were left alone, and women and children. So um, if they died while protecting their house, they could also be seen as going on to Bahala. So it was seen similar, yeah. So you didn't have to go into war, war, just like having victory. So the worst way to die was in your bed, right, peacefully. So what are some of the other afterlives, if you can remember? Hell? Yeah. 
and oblivion. Yeah. So no other afterlife was as good as the hollow, right? That was the place you wanted to get to. There was even possibility that in those other afterlives, your soul would not keep living. So you could literally, like oblivion, you could literally just disappear, which is scary, right? So either you had to do something major in your life, normally in the sake of violence, to go on to the good, to the good realm, or you either lived out in mediocrity or even disappeared. There is the idea that your soul could just not live on. And there is reincarnation um, technically in the Norse belief system, even if, you know, the idea was more like how we see in, um, in the Christian mythology, the uh, second coming. Um, that same concept in, uh, with the Valhalla is that everyone would return to Earth to fight along uh, Thor and Odin's side. Anyway, yeah, so moving on from there, the Christian concept of the afterlife already seemed a lot better <laughs> in relation, especially if you were not a fighting person, because all you had to do was, in fact, quite simpler to get into a nicer place, which was, you know, follow, um, uh, follow the Ten Commandments, which at that time, remember, the only form of Christian, Christianity coming through was, in fact, Catholicism. Um, and eventually, of course, the beliefs in how to get towards heaven or hell or slightly change from one version to the next. Okay, so a little bit of the whole backstory. <laughs> I could go forever about this. There's so much information. It's such an interesting culture. But these pieces in particular, the prow of the Norse ship, believe it or not, were incredibly scary in the ancient world. Because imagine that you are on, say, a coastal town in Britain in like way early medieval high Aaron, way early medieval England. We're just saying to the scary partners. <laughs> okay, imagine that you're uh, on a little village town near the coast in England and it's dawn. So what's coming off of the water at dawn in the early morning? Fog, right. So fog, maybe it's pretty quiet. And all of a sudden, you see something pierce through the fog. What is it? Yes. The monster's head you will see first coming through the fog. Now, you have to give yourself a, you know, we take advantage of seeing props and costumes and stuff all the time. It's really easy for us to tell the difference between something real and something fake. But we have to remind ourselves that people back at the time, like our, their eyes didn't have the same level of image filtration that we do now. So they wouldn't, they're not normally used to seeing something like this, but to see it move in the water in the distance coming towards you, how do you think that you would feel, your poor village yourself, if you saw that? Help. Yeah, exactly. They were terrified. And that is step number one when you're fighting someone else. You see this in our common war tactics today. Intim if you can intimidate the other side, their chances of uh, winning diminish by a lot. So that means if you can intimidate them, um, you can affect their they're conscious, they're in their subconscious, and then they might even question whether or not they will win. And then that is half the battle, right? Um, but there's also another side for this too. Um, they did believe at this point in time that giant serpents and uh, dragons lived in the water. And it was sort of very clever thinking on the suspicious sailor side to have this prow that looks like a dragon above the water to scare off the other dragons. The idea that why would they mess with a smaller dragon? You know, why would they attack their own? Um, and so there was two full ways. So the, the, uh, when you're going on a Viking, the Nordic peoples were very suspicious. Okay. Um, so it was intimidating. It was also quite beautiful to have these things on there. They're still highly prized today. There is actually a number of Viking ships still in operation, believe it or not going around the world. I've met a few people who have ridden on some of those, and um, it's really neat. I know one crew that actually sailed from, I believe it was Baltimore, maybe Delaware. They sailed out, they caught the current and sailed out to Iceland 
and then below Greenland and then back to Ireland on one of these recreation boats. That people have recreated down to each plank, so it's somewhat of an obsession. So I know some people who spent two months on the ocean and in one of these recreation vessels, and how they said how strange and exciting everything was. Yeah, and imagine being caught out in the storm in the Atlantic. That's pretty nuts. Um, <laughs> just in this. Um, I think they have like some modern things to like for people to check in on them. Um, but you know, all these guys also took like two months off of work. I said guys, but there are not always guys on board the ship. In fact, sometimes it was 50-50. So in this Nordic uh, culture, was it, only, was it only men who could battle? No, right. What were you called if you were a woman who went to battle? The Valkyrie is a sort of a, a cosmic version. Um, the Valkyrie, I would say, is not a common descriptor of like the everyday woman who would go to battle. You're actually named after the your main tool in battle. Mm -hmm. I know what you're going for. All women look to Valkyries as inspiration. You're in fact called a shield maiden. So it sounds like not quite as cool as shield maiden, but women actually, you could fight with shields at this time, and women did have a blade as well. And the next slide I have here is about those shield maidens. Have you guys ever watched the show Vikings before? Yes, okay. So, Spoilers, <laughs> main character, but you see her in the first scene, one of the main characters is a shield maiden. Um, and this is a clip from her, which lasts for 2 minutes and 32 seconds. I want you guys to open that up, and it's cool that I have two ladies in here as well today. Um, but this is a martial artist who stars in the show, and I want you guys to see how she goes through her training, trying to recreate these old battle techniques, and then how it looks on screen. It's a pretty precise clip. You guys are welcome to write down what you're surprised by before it ends. I'll put on the timer. Oh no! Okay. Insecure. Hmm. Let me click on the link. If you can get onto YouTube, Elizabeth, you could probably type in Viking um, Shield Maiden here. This is, I'll give you the, I'll post a clip of the title. Whatever your big job ah. is, come into the Ram Big Finish event and get a great deal on the truck with the first sale value in the industry.
have? That's awesome. So Erin, you might not be too surprised <laughs> about Sheila Maiden. Um, but maybe you can think back to that age when your mom first showed you if there's anything that would surprise you. And maybe someone watching this recording later would be surprised as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, I remember when I first watched that clip, and she talked about historical accuracy a little bit, when she said that in her martial arts training, obviously it would make sense in a certain situation to do a roundhouse kick, but that's not period appropriate, so she has to hold back on her old training, the stuff that makes sense in the action movie, and do something that would apply to be more historic, so actually using that shield not only to like protect yourself, but also like as like a disc for to hit somebody. And how you know women had to essentially fight differently, especially in situations against men, to use to use their own strength. It was, used to be believed because, um, you know, and this is true. It used to be only men were archaeologists. <laughs> you know, women were allowed to be archaeologists. Yeah, yeah, very similar fighting style to Captain America, right? That's a great crossover there. So Captain America also fights with his shield. Um, so it used to be women weren't allowed to be archaeologists and weren't taken seriously until much later on in history. But they had uncovered a grave, uh, a mass grave found on eastern shore of Ireland that um, they believed were just Viking men um, who had tried to settle there and uh, died in battle. They now, after some detection, they saw that graves were buried in couples, so there were two skeletons, and that one was a male and one was a female. And it was believed that women went on to those Vikings to settle. So women were known to fight in situations where they're trying to take over an area or a bit of land in order to settle there. And that's what started happening and why the British culture changed so much. So British, I mean England, Scotland, and Ireland changed so much. Because at first, um, Viking, the Viking raids came just to get supplies and money and um, food and all those stores. But later on, as the um, Scandinavian population was growing and people were wanting more land, they actually came to settle. So at around the same time that Iceland and Greenland were settled, settled so there were also colonies of like Nordic people that were um, in the British Isles, particularly in the north as well. So in the northern part of Scotland, there's a section called the Hebrides, which I believe is spelled like, I'm going to try and spell it. Like, it's like H-O-I Brides. Where today they even say genetically they're all like 70% um, Nordic, more so than Celtic. So this is where your, the cultural crossover is happening. So eventually Viking raidings, Viking raids stopped because the Nordic population had just moved in. Um, and eventually you're fighting against your own brothers and nationalism this morning. Interesting stuff here. Okay. So thinking about our own culture today, what are some ways that we see um, culture is trying to intimidate one another. You can type it on the board, you can look up the image. How, how is intimidation still happening? I might have to think for a second, that's okay.
Hmm. Think about maybe the movies you watch. Are there any movies that you see them discuss some other culture or nation in the not positive view or Ooh, <laughs> that's interesting. So there's no McDonald's in North Korea, is what I take that as, right? Armies? Mm, yeah, and armies, armies are incredibly intimidating, right? Or even like the discussion of weapons, right? You, it doesn't even matter if you actually have a weapon, but to say that you have a weapon it makes the other countries get fiercely freaked out, right? Yeah, military in general, right. I think it's Costa Rica which is the only country with a non-active um, military, I think. I might be wrong. But there's very few countries that do not have a military at all. And they're all kind of organized differently. But even, even if you're neutral in all things, like Switzerland, they have a very intense military because they have to enforce being neutral, right? Else they're easily intimidated. Good crossover there. Okay, so sort of in contrast, but bringing it up to current day, this is the artist from, um, I believe, Finland. So this is a Scandinavian artist, current temporary artist, named, and I'm trying to say this, I might be wrong, Jorgen Haugen Sorensen. And then, I don't know if you guys watched the World Cup at all um, when Iceland played. You tend to know the culture um, as being Nordic derived when it ends in sun. So, I had a friend, you see it's actually all in, um, uh, you're in a, like, British countries as well, but if it ends in sen or sun, that means, like, the son of Soren, and that's a common last name now. So that's a good pointer to, um, yeah, it's a good pointer to if, if someone's name is from Nordic origin. Um, but if you look over here, like, Thor Odinson, right, the son of Odin, exactly. So it's in the nomenclature. You were always named after your father. Your last name was your father's first name, which used to be the old ways, which is why when you read, you know, they would say, Thor, oh, son of Odin, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so. Um, your lineage had to be memorized as well. <laughs> but now we just have one last name in our culture. But there, you see it happen, I think, um, in Spain, there's still a strong tradition as well of having, um, taking your last name of the person before you and their last name. I think Picasso had 16 last names. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's an old tradition that some cultures definitely still have. That's a lot. It's a lot of last names. <laughs> Um, but the piece to the right here is actually made in 2018, and this is bronze, and it's called The Newly Arrived. Um, and this right here at the bottom left is actually a clip from an interview I watched with him. Um, and he says here, sometimes I wonder if mankind is the happiest when it kills. Um, so in this concept of intimidation today, there's a lot of internalizing this history, especially that you see in Nordic works or con contemporary Nordic works, um, Scandinavian artists. But the piece right here to the right, think about current events, May 2018, the newly arrived. Who is he referring to? Who all of a sudden is arriving 
in Finland. And it's not just Finland, it's all over Europe. United States is taking in some, but a surprisingly small amount. Yes, refugees, right. So this is a piece that can really stand, it can be any, any person that's newly arrived in, or any refugee, but we do believe that it is resonating with the Syrian crisis as well, so the Syrian refugees. So we don't have a whole lot of detail, like there's not specific people here, but what is he trying to communicate about these refugees? Dirty and malformed, yeah. Even a little bit disturbing, right? I definitely got that vibe the first thing I saw. And when you see some of his other works, you can type in his name. If you even get similar to it, I'm sure he'll pop up. Um, he's been on the scene for quite a bit. He's an older, older gentleman, but all of his works tend to be very sort of a dark subject. He doesn't use a lot of color, but he still is sort of speaking of these consequences of intimidation. He did a lot of work dealing with the consequence of war. And he thinks a lot about the human nature and why we're doing it in the first place, which is a cool, an interesting concept to see and kind of see how things have come somewhat full circle culturally, right? Um, like generations on generations of one culture intimidating another culture. Like we're seeing huge consequences across the world right now. And they're happening in our own lifetime, too. So it's important not to forget that. But he did a lot of observations on human nature. And I think that we can respect him as an artist because he can communicate a lot with not a whole lot of, like, incredibly fancy detail, right? He's not showing you the shape of noses or eyes. Um, he's just giving you rough forms. Very full of emotion, right. It's like all emotion, not as much accuracy, but he doesn't seem to care about that, but it still works really well. There's an, on the image to the left is actually, um, he's talking about this piece he did with a whole bunch of skulls. It looks very like um, Hollywood-esque, but you can tell here how he can do all the classic works of, or classic forms in sculpture, but he chooses to make it look rough and sort of disgusting instead. Okay, so going back to that, I'll go back to that original image to give you a refresher. We're going to talk about the style and the process a bit. So let's see, Elizabeth, you were here first, I'm going to give you style, the first one, and then Erin, if you could talk about process. Um, it's a very, it's not a very sophisticated process. <laughs> I'm sure whatever you come up with is probably going to be right. But if you can tell us how it was made and what it's made out of, it's a ship, so it's an old school ship as well. Or a part of an old school ship. Yeah, let me turn off the follow. A North Prow figurehead. Mm -hmm. I always think of the Norse style as being also a little bit clunky as well. They're not quite as 
elegant to say the Roman. Mm, perfect. It's so interesting. I remember reading um, from Edith Hamilton's mythology back, I think, when I was in the ninth or tenth grade. She wrote about um, how, are we, yeah, they wrote about how terrible um, the Norse were at navigating. So they were sailing all the time, but they were bad at maps. <laughs> so they were often find a place and then forget it. And that's what they believed happened with them. Um, America, like they found England, they found um, um, Canada long before Christopher Columbus ever came to the New World, but um, they forgot about it. <laughs> they couldn't find their way back as easily because they weren't very good at math. So even when you, you see them talk about their own world and the world tree, they had all the different realms, but they couldn't tell you which one was where. Yeah, well, I also thought, I think they, their their cultural structure was a little bit different, too. But yeah, if it weren't for, I believe, the astrolabe, which was, you know, of course, um, taken from Arabic. Um, there's an Arabic crossover there. Um, if it weren't for that, they wouldn't actually be able to find their way back to places either. So a lot of their technology was, in fact, taken from others. That's a good point that you made. Um, so we see here that it almost looks like it's made from outside part and made a base of something else. Yeah, like there's different kinds of wood. It is in the end carved wood, but you're right, there probably is different kinds of tree that they're using and that it looks like there's like a sheath almost stuck onto a piece of wood. And we see here that the Nordic craft figurehead, it represents the monsters to frighten people and fighting off monsters. Yeah, they're practical people. It's just two for one. Um, and then the detail, detail often represents that world tree, those loose knots, sort of. Okay, so we'll do our compare and contrast. I can help you guys out with this one, too. How are they similar and how are they different? It's kind of, these are interesting ones to compare and contrast. Mm. Actually, technically, this Mayan calendar is made from stone, but there are some made in metal. Yeah, the Mayans were much more stone carvers, um, whereas the Norse were much more wood carvers. Looks good to me, guys. Give me a thumbs up if you're already in the bottom or a check mark. Affirmation. Excellent. Okay. All right, impact. So how do you think the prow of the Norse ship, something like this, might have affected the art world? I actually already showed you, Elizabeth, in that crossover image in the beginning. There's some design pattern work that we know now. Oh, yeah, sir, sorry. My man. All right, I want to on this slide. So how do you think that this work has affected the art world? And Elizabeth was here in that question answer time or the lecture time. I put an image on the screen. So there are other ways, too. Even down to our own culture. Simplicity with purpose, definitely. What is something that we've taken from the Norse that we 
we use every week to describe our own sense of time. Yeah, later Celtic designs, Celtic knot, knot work is directly inspired from the Norse invasion. So other than Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, every other day, so all the other four days are named after who? Any guesses? So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? You know Thursday Thor? Right. Tuesday is pre traditionally pronounced Tears Day, which is after the Norse god Tyr. Wednesday comes from the word Woden. So you know how Wednesday is spelled super confusingly, like Wednesday? It comes from the word Woden, who is also called Odin, or Odin, as you guys might know. Um, and actually, if you go to Iceland today, they still use the word Woden to describe him. And then th Thursday, yep, Friday is Freya. Exactly, so Friday is the day for Freya. Excellent work, guys. So every, this is something that we can definitely see direct um, impacts of being colonized by the Nordic people. So lastly, before we end today, if you guys want to write how learning about something from this session has inspired you or impacted you. And I will turn off the recording. There's a bear cub outside.